there's a great fascination today with espionage, with spies. Two, two of the uh, current bestsellers on the fiction list are uh, John Le Carre's new book, Legacy of Spies, in which he resurrects his old character, George Smiley. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the work of Daniel Silva, mm -hmm. his uh, book, The Black Widow, and the follow-up book, House of Spies, are also currently on the bestseller list. Uh, James Bond is a perennial uh, in films. Bridge of Spies, was a, based on a true story, was a great success a year ago. On TV, The Americans, which is about a couple of Russian spies who live in the United States and do terrible things, <laughs> and there's, you know, as a result of orders given to them, but raised two quintessentially American children. Uh, to, and even within the uh, world of current events, you hear very often references to Snowden and Assange and Chelsea Manning, WikiLeaks, all of these controversial um, uh, elements are related to the whole question of spying and espionage. So today, what I'm going to try to do is uh, give you some uh, understanding of the, the evolution of the cult or the craft of spying. Because it has, the first, uh, I guess, references to it occur in the Bible. When Moses sends out 12 spies to reconnoiter the land of Canaan and to bring back word of whether the land is suitable or how the inhabitants live or are they well armed and so on and so forth. They come back with a negative report, so the Israelites wander in the desert for another 40 years. But nevertheless, that's one of the first references to the, the cult of um, the spy. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to make a differentiation between espionage and intelligence, and I'll then try to follow up with that. I'm going to give you a definition of espionage by one of the greatest spies in modern history, Kim Philby. Do you know the name at all? The master spy who became a leader of British intelligence but was simultaneously a Russian spy and who ended his days in Moscow. The collect this is his uh, definition of espionage. The collection of secret information from foreign countries by illegal means. Today, it includes not just foreign countries, but transnational groups also, such as Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and so on. The uh, intelligence, that's the craft of putting together various bits of information clandestinely acquired to draw a conclusion. So that the uh, agents, spies, attempt to discover secrets and to advance foreign causes. And the uh, intelligence operators are generally decoders, <coughs> hackers. Uh, they uh, specialize in electronic uh, operations, and they try to learn their enemy plans in advance. So there is a distinction. And very often, the work of spies is referred to as human, human intelligence. Spies, agents, attempts, those who attempt to discover secrets. SIGINT, S-I-G-I-N-T, is the word used to refer to electronic intelligence. That is, uh, to discover enemies' plans in advance and to put together that, uh, the, the um, the way in which to combat it. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of human, human intelligence and SIGINT, uh, electronic intelligence. And I'm going to go back to the year 1917. This is the 100th anniversary, of course, of 
1917, which many historians think was maybe the most critical year in the 20th century. <clears throat> Why? Because the United States entered World War I in April and changed the direction and the balance of the war. Because the Russians experienced two revolutions, a democratic revolution in March and the communist revolution in, um, in November. <clears throat> And finally, the Balfour Declaration in November. And some of you, I think, who were with me last year know that we spent a lot of time on that. <clears throat> now, the, um, oh, the uh, episode I'm going to speak of is an example of SIGINT, that is uh, uh, signal intelligence electronic intelligence, and I'm referring to the Zimmerman telegram. You probably have heard of it. Do you, does anybody know what it was involved in the Zimmerman telegram? Okay, let me give you the, the story of it. The uh, United States had, had kept the peace through 1916, but it was becoming more and more tenuous as 1917 dawned. The United States had become quite prosperous as a result of the war in Europe. We were doing a great deal of business with the Allies. Because of the British blockade, all of the business was done with England. We had a vested interest in the success of England. However, in uh, January the 1st of 1917, the, the German government announced that it was going to put an end to neutral shipping in a designated zone. Any neutral ship found in that zone would be sunk. This was a red flag, as you can imagine. Wilson had grown increasingly discontented with the Germans. Uh, they apparently had... Uh, sponsored subversion in the United States. German agents had blown up the Black Tom factory in Jersey City. Uh, the, uh, he had attempted a peace initiative in 1916, which the Germans would have nothing of, especially since they seemed to be winning. And so uh, 1917 dawned in an increasingly difficult atmosphere. <coughs> now, who was Zimmerman? Well, he was an undersecretary of state at the French embassy, uh, at, at, excuse me, the foreign embassy, a uh, foreign ministry in Berlin. He was second highest rank of the, what was the equivalent of, of the uh, German State Department. British intelligence, which was in its earliest form, they were attempting to break German codes. They had assembled a group of experts in, they were known as Room 40 at the Admiralty Building in London. And they were mostly amateur mathematicians, linguists, and cryptologists. And they were at work on the German cipher code, especially for the messages from the Foreign Office in and out of Berlin. In 1916, they broke the code. And they were now able to read messages from the Foreign Office in Berlin to embassies all over the world. So at, on January the 1st of 1917, they struck gold. They uncovered a message from the Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs in Berlin to the German uh, ambassador in Mexico. <clears throat> now, the message, I'm going to read you a little bit of the message. This was it. Okay. We make Mexico, this is the Germans, a proposal of alliance on the following terms. Generous financial support and an undertaking on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. You will inform the President of Mexico 
that as soon as the outbreak of war with the United States is certain, please call the President's attention to the fact that the ruthless employment of our submarines now offers the prospect of compelling England in a few months to make peace. Well, this was a godsend. What did it say? We will reward you with Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico if you will attack the United States. They also suggested that Japan might be willing to enter the coalition. This was pure gold. When should they spring it? Well, on the 10th of, uh, the, the message had been sent on the 16th of January. They handed it to the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Balfour, almost immediately. He waited for the right moment. On the 23rd of February of 1917, they handed the telegram to the U.S. Ambassador. On the 1st of March, after deliberating, Wilson made it public. However, he's insisted it might be a fraud. On the 29th of March, Zimmerman affirmed, it's not a fraud, it's real. Nobody understands why, but presumably he wanted to, um, he was sure that war was inevitable, and so the United States ought to know that they would face an invasion by Mexico if they declared war on Germany. This is one of the dumbest things in the history of diplomacy. The sec that was re he was he uh, affirmed its authenticity on the 29th of March, and on the 6th of April, war was declared. You can imagine the stir in the country as a result of the Zimmerman telegram, and apparently. Um, there was a tremendous backlash against Germany, and the United States went into war with all flags flying. The Washington Post headline, German plot to conquer the US with the aid of Mexico and Japan. The New York Times, Germany seeks an alliance against the United States asks Mexico and Japan to join. All right, that was then, 1917. The British continued working on coding, decoding, and electronics. They had made the initial breakthrough. The United States, no. In 1929, we had a coding operation, a decrypting operation going on, but the Secretary of War, Stimson, closed it down. Why? This is what he said. Gentlemen, don't read each other's mail. <laughs> this was the German attaché in the United States in 1936. It was so easy. The Americans are so broad-minded, they print everything. You don't need any intelligence service. You have only to be industrious and read the newspapers. In 1936, for example, one of the great American discoveries, the Norden, or the uh, uh, inventions, the Norden bomb site, which proved critical to air warfare, was sold. It was on the market, the open market. Detailed reports on rocket experiments in the newspapers. So we might say that the United States was not, it didn't catch on to the change from human intelligence to electronics, but the British did. And throughout the 30s, 20s and 30s, they continued the work that Room 40 had begun in 1917. The, this would lead to the greatest coup in the history of electronic research, Bletchley Park. You probably all saw The Imitation Game, so you know something about it already, although the, the movie was not terribly accurate. The British decided to continue 
the decoding efforts and the encrypting efforts, electronic intelligence. They didn't give up on human intelligence, but they, they thought that pursuing electronic intelligence would be more fruitful. Now, in Germany, in 1926, you could go and buy a machine on the open market. It was called the Enigma machine. It was designed, the Enigma machine was designed for banks to safeguard deposits and so on. In 1926, it was adapted as an encoding device by the German Navy and in 1928 by the German Army. They saw that with modifications, this machine would create a situation that would make uh, intelligence as secure as a bank vault. It could only be decrypted unless, if the interceptor had an identical machine. Range of settings, enormous. The range of settings on the original Enigma machine, the coding machine, was 160 trillion. That was the difficulty of breaking it. Well, in Poland in 1929, and the Poles had a very chancy existence, you know, sort of all through their existence, they'd been sort of squeezed between Germany and Poland and uh, Russia. They, by accident, got hold of a, uh, an Enigma machine. And Polish intelligence began their efforts to find a decrypting uh, answer to it. Tried to read it. Apparently had some difficulty, but a Polish worker in a German factory who had concealed his identity was able to smuggle out some of the parts. So they began this process of decoding German messages. In 39, the invasion of Poland, the Polish cryptographers fled to France, where they gave the machine to uh, the Deuxième Bureau, the French Secret Service. And as the Germans closed in in 1940, they uh, fled to England and they brought the machine and all the progress they had made with them. Well, the apparently uh, the British Churchill loved gadgets. You know, Churchill invented the tank. I don't know if you knew that. That was seen as an antidote to tank war uh, to uh, trench warfare. And but he loved gadgets, and he was immediately taken with this. They decided that they would set up a secret site in England, a large estate, Bletchley Park, and there they would gather. The, the greatest mathematicians and engineers, cryptographers in England. They had the Enigma machine. It was the actually the army version of the Enigma machine, not the naval. And there they would attempt this massive effort of breaking the code. Now, there were a number of... Uh, they brought together, in fact, the most brilliant mathematicians and cartographers and so on, uh, in England. The uh, movie version shows Alan Turing as the leading light, but there were several others who were uh, equally gifted and uh, brilliant. They had numerous mathematicians, linguists, and there was a lot of mechanical clerical work to do, so there were hundreds of clerks and typists as well. And they were sworn, sworn to total secrecy on the project. The, the existence of what was called ULTRA, that was the project's name, to break the Enigma machine, was not revealed for 30 years after the war. And when it was finally revealed, a lot of the uh, books that had been written about the North African campaign, for example, had to be rewritten because they did not understand what the decryption you know, had brought them. In fact, Churchill referred to Bletchley Park and the whole Ultra Project as the geese who laid the golden eggs and never cackled. <laughs> well, 
the significance, of course, is if you know what the enemy is going to do before he does it, that's a big advantage in warfare. Several notable achievements of the, uh, of, of the uh, breaking of the Enigma code. And the Germans never caught on. The Enigma machine looks like a, a typewriter. And if you see pictures of German soldiers at war, very often on the back of the um, motorcycle, you'll see something that looks like a typewriter. What they had to create was a machine that duplicated the Enigma machine, but in reverse. So they had to, uh, they called it a bomb, B-O-M-B-E, that was the title for it. It had been invented by Turing. Turing had studied at Princeton with Einstein. He was the leading mathematician uh, of, the, of the, uh, the day. But he was also a very strange person in some ways. For example, when it seemed in 1940 that England was going to be invaded by the Germans after the Battle of France, he converted all his assets into silver bars and buried them. Then he forgot where he buried them. <laughs> Never found them. <laughs> Anyhow, this was the greatest achievement in the history of... And it changed things. Bell Labs had uh, apparently uh, discovered... the first, had, had manufactured the first primitive computer. But it was truly the Enigma machine... Uh, the uh, project at Bletchley Park that led to the creation of the first programmable computer. That was called Colossus in 1943, I think. So in a sense, what happened was a new age was born. The computer age was born as a result of these wartime experiments. It's estimated by many historians that the achievement shortened the war by two to three years. I'll give you some examples of the achievements. In North Africa, a critical battle between Rommel and uh, Montgomery. You know that, the Desert War it was called. They had broken, at Bletchley Park, they had broken all of Rommel's codes. And they knew exactly where he was going before he went. They also knew what supplies he needed. So when sh the ships were uh, en route, mostly Italian ships, en route to North Africa, they were sunk. Now, they were afraid the Germans would put two and two together. How did they manage to sink all the supply ships? They must know something. So they put out a message saying, wasn't it wonderful for the Italian secret service to provide us with all this information? <laughs> It just it was a, a game of total deception and cunning. Uh, the first great naval battle of World War uh, World War Two was the battle of the battleship Bismarck versus the Hood. B the Bismarck was the su super battleship of its day, had a crew of something like twenty five hundred. The Hood was the greatest British battleship of the day. It was sunk by the Bismarck with a loss of about fifteen hundred sailors on board. Where was the Bismarck going next? They thought it was going to Norway for repairs, but they broke the decrypt at Bletchley Park and they discovered it was going to the French port of Brest. They followed it and sank it with a loss of 2,500 lives. The, the super battleship, that was entirely due to the electronic breakthrough at Bletchley Park. <coughs> So it was a great advance, and eventually, as I say, it opened a whole new world. It opened the world of the computer, <coughs> and uh, the world was never the same. Okay, Bletchley, this is a, a historical judgment. Bletchley was the single greatest achievement of Britain during 1939-45, perhaps during the century as a whole. Bletchley was Britain's singular contribution, not just to victory, but to the development of the modern world. So from the Zimmerman telegram to, and I might mention also that Americans were working on the Japanese code, which contained elements of the Enigma machine, courtesy of the German allies. And they worked on the code, uh, and it was broken, 
by a man named William Friedman, who was a, had been brought here as an immigrant, as a, as a baby. The code was called Purple. In fact, there's a book about Friedman called The, the Man Who Broke Purple. And eventually, it too, it led to the victory at Midway. No one knew where the battleship fleet of the, of the Japanese was headed, all kinds of possibilities. We knew it was Midway, and we could prepare for it. We knew that the architect of Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto, uh, was uh, taking a plane ride. He was due uh, for an inspection tour in the South Pacific. They uncovered that decrypt, and they shot down the plane, killed him. So there were great victories also. And of course, electronic <laughs> intelligence today has really swept the field. I'm going to be talking from now on about human agents, because I think it's maybe more interesting. But it's, it's uh, notable, I think, that the um, human agents never really could attain the certainty of uh, electronic intelligence. So let me say a word or two before I leave Alan Turing. Now I'm going to tell you a story. It may or may not be true. It's a legend. Turing, after the war, he was, I might point out that he was a homosexual. And apparently, after the war, this was illegal in England at the time, and he was arrested. Even though, you know, he had attained this, this great fame, he was arrested and sentenced to prison. And after prison, he was subjected to the common uh, remedy, which was chemical castration. Well, apparently, it had terrible impact on whoever received it. And so he, about seven years after this tremendous achievement, committed suicide. He committed suicide he always ate an apple before he went to bed. So he injected the apple with cyanide. And in the morning, they found the half-eaten apple on the bedside table. So far, okay. Now this part I can't attest to because it's a legend. How would you pay tribute to the man who really was the father of the computer? Well, in uh, a few years ago, Jobs, Steve Jobs, was attempting, was had invented you know where I'm going? Okay, I don't know if it's true. They say it's a legend, but it makes sense to me. What was he, how would he pay tribute to Turing? Well, an apple with a bite out of it, yeah. <laughs> filled with, I guess, strychnine or whatever. That, I don't know if anybody can nail it down, but it is presented in several books as the origin of uh, the... Uh, because it is a kind of a funny name for a computer company, wouldn't you think? Okay. All right. Well, now we're going to turn from, go back in again, go back to 1917. I think that um, human intelligence is today vastly outperformed by uh, electronic. In fact, if you wanted to volunteer as a spy, they, you could be Googled in two minutes, and they would know your entire past, right? You couldn't get away with it today. So the most brilliant spies would be naked in two minutes flat. So human intelligence has, in a sense, really come to an end. It's all computers now. And it's come to an end mainly because of the invention of the computer. Nevertheless, um, I'm going to go back to the human element. And I don't know how far I'll get, but I want to go back to 1917. I, I might mention that there was another very famous spy case in 1917, not just the Zimmerman telegram, but the execution of uh, one of the most famous of all spies, Mata Hari. She was executed in October of 1917 by firing squad. And apparently, she, um, her papers and uh, the, whole, the case was put on a uh, secret file, and the file is supposed to be opened 100 years after the execution, which is next month. Oh. So you watch the papers. 250 books have been written about matter. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. All right. 250 books. This year, she, uh, the Dutch government, she was of Dutch nationality, is planning all kinds of ceremonies in her memory. They are, they've commissioned a ballet. They've suddenly discovered she's one of their own. This is kind of an interesting tale. She, um, she was, uh, she was of Dutch nationality, five foot eight, which was a little tall for a woman in those days. A lot of the stories told about her are untrue. Nevertheless, there are a few details that have been nailed down. They know that she, for example, was born, it was the daughter of a Dutch businessman who went broke, bankrupt, family split up. There was a newspaper ad by a Captain Rudolph McLeod. He was advertising for a wife. He was 38. She was 18. But she answered the ad, and they were married. He was posted to Java. That's where he, uh, he was a British consul in, in Java. So uh, her name was Marguerite, actually. Marguerite Zella. So Marguerite found herself in Java, very fascinated by the native culture, the dances, and so on. It was a very bad marriage. And eventually, uh, it broke up. And she left Java and went to Paris. This is what she said. I thought all women who ran away from their husbands went to Paris. So she went to Paris. And there she arrived in 1902. She rode a circus horse under the name Lady McLeod. She posed for artists. She took the name Matahari, which means Eye of the Sun, in Javanese. She invented a whole new identity for herself. She said she was born in India. Her parents were Bra her father was a Brahmin priest. She was a devotee of Shiva, the great Indian god. She specialized in erotic dancing, mostly wearing very little clothing, a sarong. Um, and men fell at her feet, had numerous lovers, uh, apparently uh, the talk of Europe. Puccini was one of her lovers, the French minister of war, a German general. She didn't discriminate. <laughs> war comes, 1914. Amata is a neutral. The Dutch, the Dutch never entered the war, stayed neutral through the war. She could travel throughout Europe on a Dutch passport. She was apparently approached by the German consul in uh, The Hague and asked when you go to Paris the next time, maybe you could do us a few favors. Look around. He gave her 20,000 francs and three bottles of secret ink and asked her to please look around and report back any details, soldiers, encampments, and so on. Well, apparently she was not much of a spy. Uh, by 1916, the Germans had decided they weren't getting their money's worth. So they sent her instructions on a secret network that they knew the French had broken. The French would be able to read the... Uh, they did it purposely to expose her because she was such a rotten spy. <laughs> well, the French police came to the Plaza Atine suite where she was staying and arrested her. It's now 13th of February, 19